Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's Friday evening. It happens to be movie review night. It happens to be nine o'clock. And she, we shall sit and talk, discuss, analyze the movie. But first, as always, a little music. Enjoy. We are all the heirs to Scotland as a nation proudly stands. We will march beneath a banner to protect our ancient land. In the glens and cities, there on every street, are the living heroes, no harmony will defeat. Let a flag mean freedom and not a battle drum to the world we bid a welcome in a thousand different ways we will toast to long lost friendships as we build our better days in the glens and cities, there on every street, are the living heroes no army will defeat. Let a flag mean freedom and not a battle drum. We are all the heroes of Scotland. We're a nation hand in hand. We will march beneath a banners to protect our ancient In the glens and cities, there on every street, are the living heroes no army will defeat. Let a flag mean freedom and not a battle drum. Good evening, folks. I hope you're all well, cosy and comfy. Nice to see you all here. And of course, as you all know, we're going to review Hans Labrath, that perennial favourite. Now I shall introduce our reviewers, esteemed fellow travellers, Eke from the US of A. Good evening, Eke. Good morning, after evening, good evening. Good after evening. Good evening, Magic Man. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening, Sensor. Good constant after ball. <laughs> <laughs> and good evening to the board of William. How are you doing? Will? Fit like, no bad, good, all good in the head. Excellent. Excellent. Um, 
I think we'll just start this. I have here, of course, in front of me, two sheets of A4 paper printed out on my printer, sent to me by the illustrious Eke. But there is no need for me to read this out. He is with us, which is great. So, Sensum, as you picked this movie, can you give us a brief idea of why you picked it in the first place? I picked it because it's quite a strange film. I, I, I saw it, um, I think it came out on Sky TV when I still had Sky. I don't exactly know how old it is. I think it's in the 2000s, probably something like 2006, is it? I can't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it came on Sky and it said, oh, uh, fantasy type film. I thought to myself, well, well, you know, I'm not opposed to a bit of that because it was said dark fantasy. And I was oh, yeah, I don't, I don't mind a bit of dark fantasy. So I put it on. I didn't realise it was subtitled. Till it, obviously, it was because it is a Spanish film, and the period's quite interesting because it's set after the Spanish Civil War in Spain, but um, shortly before the end of World War Two. So it's after the um, Franco's men had won in Spain, and obviously because this, the the country was pretty. Um, beat up, if you like. I don't know what the politics are. Eki can tell us what the politics are. But then Spain didn't join in with the World War Two thing. You know, they, I think they'd had the fill of conflict. Um, so this was essentially skirmish skirmishes between the rebellion, if you like, who were communists, the Reds, if you like, and also the uh, the fascist uh, soldiers who were in charge as part of Franco's government. But the tale itself takes quite a weird turn because even though that is the backdrop, it all centers around a young girl and a mum who's married this uh, captain of the, uh, you know, Franco's army who's looking after this particular region that's been uh, dogged by little skirmishes here and there of re resistance force um, from the Red, so to speak. And this girl, she's quite bookish, the young girl. Um, her mum's pregnant with a little brother. The girl herself is quite bookish and quite open-minded to uh, interesting things, shall we say. So the reason why I picked it is because there are some... If I think when I was watching it, all the way up to the point where the captain says to the doctor, don't F around with me. It actually comes up. I thought, oh, this must be like a kid's, like a dark kid's film. Like, you know, um, what was that one where they were in the forest, like Terabithia or something like that? I thought, oh, right, it's one of them films. Until, until you saw this word, you know, come up and he goes, uh, don't, you know, don't F around with me, doctor, or, or whatever it was, to this, so this, this physician who's there. I thought, all oh, right. Well, obviously, it's not. It's not um, a kids a kids movie, and the, there are. And, and Eki will probably go into the psychology of all this shit, which I I completely missed because I just watched it because it's a film. <laughs> but I watched it and I thought, you know, there are some genuinely um, good sort of fantasy bits in here, but there are also some absolutely terrifying bits. In here, some like absolutely startling bits, like some of the some of the creepies and the baddies that are in it. You know, you think, oh yeah, no, this is not a kids' film. <laughs> so I just I just found it a very interesting watch back then. I haven't watched it again until I watched it today. I watched it this afternoon, so I was fresh in my mind. Yeah, and, um, I still found it somewhat intriguing, even though even though I knew what what was going to happen. And I knew the, the premise of the story. It was still very intriguing to rewatch again. Mm. So Toff is, yeah, he's, he's right. What he says about that legend film, that sort of quite dark uh, fantasy sort of theme, but also not for kids, really, at the end of the day. No, no. If no. You, 
out the violence, um, the sort of the military violence and um, some of the colourful language, shall we say. Although I can only recollect that being the one instance where colourful language is used, you probably would have got away with it in the same sort of vein as, um, you know, uh, legend, you know, a similar sort of vein as that. Um, but obviously because of the violence and the struggle that's going on subsequent to the fantasy side of the story, um, it, it obviously isn't. But it, I, I just found it, I, I just found the, the, the place in, in time and also the locale, because obviously it's a Spanish film, but the placing of that film at that particular point in time in Spanish history was was quite interesting and I thought it was you know because obviously it was um, Guillermo del Toro who directed it who then went on to do many many other uh, bigger and better films so to speak I think that this film was probably one that put him on the map because I think it did win in uh, some of the films some of like you know the foreign language awards in like the Oscars or the BAFTAs or whatever so I think that sort of put him on the map shall we say but yeah I found it to be quite an intriguing film and I thought it would make uh, an interesting pick for discussion. <laughs> and I also wanted to save William from having to pick fantasy again. So. <laughs> well, well, let's move on to young William. What's your thoughts on this film, William, to begin with? Oh, me. Um, oh, my. I, I kind of felt like I was being punished. No. <laughs> <laughs> what, what have you done? You needed punish for. I know, right? <laughs> I must have been terrible in my past life. But I thought Centrum was, uh, yeah, just punishing me, basically. But I, I wasn't that keen on it, to be fair. I, I, would I say I liked it? That would be too strong. I found it interesting and uh, somewhat intriguing. But it was hard to kind of keep up with it. Uh, for me, it's fantasy is not up my street, and I was kind of twixing between: is it fantasy? Is it horror? I'm unsure. I think when the guy got his face stabbed in, I kind of realised then that it might be it might be more of a horror, and uh, <laughs> definitely not a kids film for sure. But yeah, it was. I don't know. It's weird because as much as I I never really liked it, I feel like I want to watch it again. So, pretty strange. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. What well, what is it you think would draw you back to it? Uh, I guess kind of when it got to the end of the film, I couldn't really conclude it to to an extent, and um, I got the feeling was was the girl maybe not well mentally, rather than this whole other world that was going on and the whole uh, fascist Spain part of it, I kind of wanted to watch it again to feel a bit more as to if there if there was a message there going on behind the scenes. It, it felt like there was too much going on for me to just sort of conclude it with uh, one watch. But <laughs> yeah, it's weird because I feel like I kind of, I will probably watch it again. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, what have you got to say, Samuel? Yeah, it kind of hit you in the face with the, the blade many, many times for me. It was not an enjoyable watch, sadly. It was a, it was a difficult one. Um, not that I'm particularly squeamish when it comes to films, but I did find that the, the violence to be realistically uh, over the top and needlessly long and drawn out which uh, detracted from my enjoyment. Um, I appreciate the technical aspects, particularly the, the makeup, the special effects, everything along those lines. Um, that was very, very good and very unique imagery for the other world. Um, and obviously we could debate whether or not it existed at all, or if it was just a, a coping mechanism for the young girl to deal with it the trauma in her life, um, but uh, very traumatic um, for the, you know, for the general audience, I imagine. But look, looking at 
uh, the director's resume. Obviously, he's a, a, a horror guy. Um, so that made sense. And he comes from a background of special effects and makeup. So again, that you know, shows where his, his strengths lie um, and why he's been a, a horror guy. Uh, this was definitely a horror. I was looking for more dark fantasy. Uh, and there wasn't enough dark fantasy for my for my tastes, sadly. Okay. Eki, what have you got to say? Well, I know what you've got to say. I've got it here in front of me, but let's hear you say it. <laughs> I guess I basically agree with uh, pretty much everything everyone has said thus far. Uh, technical aspects of the movie uh, from production, really well done. I mean, obviously, it's it's a good-looking movie. That's hard to deny. And at the same time, like, yeah, a lot of the themes, I thought, were a little heavy-handed. And, uh, well, let me rephrase that. <clears throat> Rather, let me, let me come back from that. Uh, some of the geopolitical stuff that is referenced in the movie, I thought, was just ridiculous and silly. Um, and yet there were also some, there were, there were thematic elements that I thought were interesting and very, very, um, deeply embedded and subtle that were somewhat interesting, but I don't think that they were handled particularly well. So I don't know. It's, it's, I, I saw it back in 2006 or, or so when it first came out. And at the time, I did not know then what I know now. So even back in my 2006 mentality, for some reason, the movie was just not very interesting to me. I couldn't have articulated why at the time. I just didn't think it was very good. And now I feel like I can articulate a little better because I understand the psychology of the movie a little bit better. Um, I, that's... That's a lot of words to say almost nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I may end up referring to that little piece of paper that you printed out, actually. Like, I might go point <laughs> by point a little later on if you if you care to do it. No, I don't mind at all. Okay. That's why I thought it would be better from my point of view to have it printed rather than read it off the email on the other screen. So yeah. It make, it, uh, make it more... Um, more easy for me to follow. Yeah. And therefore, a bit easier for our viewers to follow what I'm saying on behalf of you. And I, I actually do think that uh, the stuff that I outlined in the email is worth addressing in general. So. Yeah, there's a lot of good points in here. Without a doubt. Okay, that's a sort of first round here. I'll start with you, William, because I like you to go first in these matters. What was your overall impression of the captain's performance? Um, I'd have to say it, he done it well. It was good because I hated the guy. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> wanted to... Uh, I kind of wanted to finish him off when he nearly got finished off. Right. And yeah, he, he played the bad guy really well because I, I did not like him at all. And I was I was kind of glad when he got, he got uh, I, I think it was a bullet in the eye or the or the head in, yeah. into his face. Yeah. And I thought, good, he, he's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I thought, he, I thought he played it really well. Yeah. I thought he was probably... Um, probably the best doctor in it, in my view. Really? You play some yeah, that high? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Obviously, from my point of view, I've got to say, I didn't know a single person in the movie, either ones. Not a single sort that I know. However, that's a minor thing. What were you saying? Some. What was your feelings about that chap acting the uh, the captain, the leader of the 
the back. Yeah, was, was he called Vidal or something? Or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some, some kind of name, yeah. Um, I, well, he played that part really well, didn't he? Because he was thoroughly awful. And, and that's what you need when you when you want to create a character who you you genuinely want everybody in the audience to have not an ounce of sympathy or one iota of you know um, concern for. It's him, you know. So it doesn't matter what happens to him. And and immediately, you know, then they pick up the two um, hunters initially, which led to that first scene where. There's the son and the father who've been brought before them because they've been smuggling secrets between the the main village and the uh, conspirators, the resistance, if you like, in in the in the woods. Um, and after that, all bets were off. And and when you know, even at the very start, when you first meet him, and the little girl gets out of the car and he squeezes her hand. You know, that's all geared towards, and it just basically goes from squeezing a hand, smashing somebody in the face, to various levels of um, extremism, if you like, with regards to the uh, punishment he inflicts on the people who he considers his enemies. And, you know, even up to the point where the lady... Um, The sort of the servant lady Mercedes, who, who you know, not to not to put too fine a point. I think she is the main character in this film, Mercedes, the the the, the, the main sort of serving lady in the in the household. I think I think she is the main character. I know there's the young girl, and the story revolves around her, but I think Mercedes is the main character in this in this film. Okay, we can go back to that. He um he. He, up to the point where he's going to abuse her because he's lost his wife at that point, obviously. Um, and he's just about to do the dirty on this woman and she gets called out because there's another uh, skirmish or affray that's kicking off. And um, at every single instance, and, and, and his ending, which we'll probably come to a little bit later on, but his ending was quite fitting, especially the wording. <laughs> From from said Mercedes, I thought that was a very fitting ending for such a thoroughly odious character. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was played. It was played brilliantly because you 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 you, you had no um, sympathy or you just despised him, didn't you? I mean, it doesn't matter the fact you know whose side of the fence that you're on if you're on the communist side or you know the the bunch of stick, shall we say, side. Um, you just had. He just was a thoroughly odious person, and a lot of that, I believe, stems from um, him trying to live up to the bravado, shall we say, of his own father, because he was always meddling on with this uh, pocket watch, which mm. his father broke on purpose, so he would know, always know the moment of his great father's death sort of thing. And he sort of lived in the shadow of that clock. And he got it working again, purely so that he could effectively do the same thing, even though it had the broken glass, which would have been very easy to fix. But that was always a, a little reminder that this is the father's watch that would never tick again after his death and to make sure his son always knew exactly what time he died. So I think, like I say, all, all of the actors and actresses in it... Um, played their roles very, very well, but all but three of the of the characters were fairly ancillary. So there was the there was the um, the captain, Mercedes, and the young girl. Everyone else, even though they played their parts really well, were fairly ancillary to the the whole scheme of things. They were the glue, if you like, the the, the triangle that held the whole film together, in my opinion. Okay. Samuel, what did you think of that actor who played the captain? Yeah, I very much agree. He was... Uh, uh, he, he did such a good job for you to 
not like this guy and to fully loathe him. He is definitely one of the best villains I've seen on screen that's just realistically bad and inherently what we would call evil. Um, and not in an over-the-top, you know, maniacal laugh, twirly moustache kind of way. Um, he was just just guy you just wanted to slap, you know, in the face. You know, like, just let me put my hand through the screen and give him a right good punch. Because um, <laughs> he's just, just terrible, absolutely terrible. Nothing, nothing likable about him uh, <laughs> other than his ability to, to clean shave, you know. <laughs> Eki, what's your thoughts on the captain? I thought it was great. Thank you. The main characters were all subjugated women or something. But what the captain was a misogynist while also issuing personal demands of Mercedes at all times. The captain only cared about his male son but never the women under his charge i think the writers wanted to equate women with slaves or something is what you had written down here just to freshen your mind yeah that's point number two um point number one was uh the villain was ridiculous correct that's where you start yeah i uh so i'll i'll, I'll just read off of the Point number one and then uh give a couple of follow-ups on it very very sure. quick though uh the villain was ridiculous the captain uh i know you must know most of my thoughts on this point uh with him being this bad uh i don't understand why the mother marries him in the first place mm. uh that is to say he's he's a villain why would she marry a villain that makes no sense uh he's presented as pure evil and I understand that my fascism bad or whatever, but it's not believable. Uh, frustratingly, they don't even present fascism as a coherent concept to be refuted. There is no refutation of fascism. It's just that man bad. And that's overall... Uh, I understand that in a, in a movie you, you need to have some kind of a protagonist and an antagonist. If you're going to have a hero, you got to have a villain. I get it. Obstacles and so on. But I found the villain to be uh, sort of a, a paper tiger, a straw man, just, a, you know, the big baddie that everyone gets to beat up on. And for some reason, I found it unsatisfying. And in the back of my head, I knew that the writers, they were like, what's the most evil thing that we can possibly show? Oh, I know. Fascism bad. Misogyny bad. Man bad. Guns bad. Let's just make him all the bad things. And then they did. And then you're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> At a certain point, I ended up thinking to myself, you know what? Whatever the writers are uh, rallying against, suddenly I'm for it. And it's not that I'm rooting for, you know, misogyny and fascism and all that other good stuff. It's just that, you know, I, I found myself rolling my eyes at what the writers were portraying. <clears throat> it, it became so unbelievable that I was like, I, I can't believe I'm I'm watching this happen. But apparently, this is what the writers are doing, and it's so. I mean, I'm going to disagree. I thought it was cartoonish. I thought that he was mustache twirling evil. That was my actual thought as I was watching it, and like I had to pause it multiple times as I was watching it to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm looking at this. And then at a certain point, I was like, you know what? Actually, I'm going to lean into it. I am now rooting for the captain. The captain is the hero of the movie. And for some reason, that moment on. Yeah, uh, well, I thought, I thought he was a hero from, from the moment I saw him polishing his own boots. Well, that's the thing. Like, the guy has all the hallmarks of heroism. Every one of them. He is self-disciplined within reason, obviously. Uh, at one point, he does... Uh, kill some people unnecessarily oh no he does that multiple times what am I talking about he's <laughs> he's presented as being a mass murderer basically yes however in terms of his overall conduct day to day no he treats people with uh, civility uh, he is reasonable 
he is self-disciplined, uh, he does all the right things in terms of general conduct. Obviously, this is written. Okay, I don't know if you guys know this, but Guillermo del Toro is in fact a communist. I, I'm sure this comes as a major shock to everyone here. Um, but you can actually, you can catch some of uh, the writer's uh, inner thoughts spilling out onto the captain there's that really weird scene where he's shaving and for some reason he in the mirror cuts his own throat with the razor blade in the mirror and it's like where did that come from like that's yeah. not how a guy like that would behave yeah. at all but they had to throw it in there because they wanted to make him a villain and villains are weird and creepy and scary or whatever can i interrupt you on that please please that, that particular scene what I thought was incredibly interesting about that scene, and I thought it was a great scene, because of the moving camera, every time he used an object to create a cut, the position of the camera changed. Yes, uh, wipes. They used wipes a lot. I thought that was really, really effective in that particular scene. Yes. I, I Again... It's it's a great looking movie, and I will be the first one to acknowledge it looks really good. So, I get that. But anyway, yeah, coming all the way back to my thoughts on the captain, um, it's it, my my answer is itself ridiculous because I think the captain is a ridiculous character, and I found myself rooting for the most ridiculous character in the movie. I know what you mean. Yeah. Okay. That's it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <doke. laughs> well I, I thought that was one of the best shots in the film the one when he's shaving and he does that just simply because it, the camera position was was changed I, um, I will say this my favorite shots of the movie are him uh, either shaving or actually anything the captain is doing alone I was always like you know what that looks great mm. I don't know why simple act of smoking if you if you remember those scenes how they were put together as well just smoking a cigarette same thing as the, as the shaving yeah a lot of so, okay. Actually, i just realized the way that i would phrase this is um i was rooting against the writers of the movie and so i was rooting for the thing that they were rooting against which is the captain mm. That's silly on my part, by the way, and I do recognize that. Okay, that's all. <laughs> okay, so let's get to what is, I expect, supposed to be the central character, which is the, the little girl. And I'm going to start with you, Samuel. What was what was your thoughts on that girl's performance as the little girl? I thought she was really, really good. Um, obviously, this is the first time I'd seen her in a film. Uh, it applies to the whole of the cast. Um, but she was really impressive. She um, did a good job. Um, she was in that annoying, overly annoying way that a lot of child actors can be. Um, she played it pretty straight. Um, I, I enjoyed her performance. I thought it was very, very solid very subtle and believable within within that and she kind of with one exception she held fast to her own rules no exceptions to that the scene where she's uh looking at the food on the table and oh yeah 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 despite reading about not eating any of it she goes and does it anyway despite the objections of the the fairies which made absolutely no sense at all uh, and totally ruined that scene by understand why it was there they needed a trigger for the, the the monster but it was very very forced and contrived do you think there was enough separation between the way she played the fantasy scenes as to the way she played the reality scenes or should there have been a separation? I think in the reality scenes, she was a lot more 
emotional um, and more like a like an actual child, you know, being affected by the world around her. Whilst in the fantasy setting, she was almost ethereal and just along for the ride. She did she didn't have much in the way of emotion other than a slight bit of fear um, as it went along. Uh, perhaps it's because the, the world itself wasn't fully explained or delved into. Um, to say she she was okay in the the, the fantasy well, um, but within the you know the actual reality, she was much more believable as a as a frightened child that just wanted to be with her mum and the, the best for her her and her mum, and recognised that this this man would never identify as her as her father despite her mum's, uh, you know, trying trying to push that on her. Okay. What do you think, Sansom? Do you think she was better in reality than she was in the fantasy? Or do you think she was equally good or bad in both? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a curious one to answer because I, I never, I didn't think about it that because it was two separate worlds, wasn't it? But I didn't. Maybe that means I didn't see a difference because I didn't see. I mean, obviously the parts were different, but I didn't. She was, even though she was a young actress, she played a part well. She was a fairly modest uh, woman. To be honest. She was the same bookish type uh, throughout all of the things. And and, and as, as uh, Samuel already said, there was absolutely no reason on this earth of Fuller's for her to have a couple of grapes off that table. None whatsoever, because she's in a position of privilege. She's well fed. You know, even though she's, she's not the um, captain's blood daughter, she gets those privileges by proxy through her mother. Um, yeah. And I just couldn't understand it because old uh, the fawn, as he likes to call himself, um, he, he he explicitly said, you know, under threat of death, under threat of death, uh, you know, don't touch it. It'll look magnificent. It'll be, the, it'll be like the... The best feast on the earth, on in the world, you know, almost like a last supper, shall we say? <laughs> um, but it'll be the best thing in the world. Uh, whatever you do, no matter how tempted you are, don't have anything. And she's walked past bloody lobsters and mm. chickens. I'm certain there was a bit of vindaloo there, as I've just said in the chat, you know. But whatever, <laughs> well, there's all these lovely things on the table, and she gets to the grapes and goes. Oh, you know what? These grapes look like the best. No, no. If you're going to do it, do it right. Get it straight into that prawn and shrimp and every all those nice bits. A bit, of, get get a bit of beef cut. You know, if you make it worth it, if you're going to risk your life, get a bit of beef on your fork. Don't wait <laughs> to throw your life away for a couple of grapes. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, but but that was now that creepy bugger there who was sat at that table. That was one of the bits that I. Uh, I was like, ooh, yeah, that, I don't, especially his hands when he, the eye thing with his hands was like, that's like, <laughs> yeah, I'll keep you up at night if you're a kid. I, and I never showed it to me kids. I wish I had done now. Give them the heat. <laughs> <TV's before. laughs> but yeah, no, I, I thought, I thought that, I thought she played her role. I know she was supposed to be, well, the, the story is to revolve around what she did, but her performance, it was really good. But it was whether or not that was the director's, in my opinion, whether it was the director's intention, it was fairly monosyllabic. In other words, um, you know, didn't didn't deviate from or almost a, a child, you know, like a, a nun like um, innocent uh, figure. It, you know, the, there was no, how can I put it? There was, I mean, she. Like I say, she just played everything in. So you got this. She ends up ends up down in this labyrinth or whatever, and this beasty thing. And she's like, "Oh yeah, you you look nice and kind." And I'm like, "No, no, 
no, this thing looks like Satan. No, no. <laughs> you know, with his weird legs and shit like that going on in his horns. No, no, no. Don't be trusting this bugger. Yeah, yeah, all you need to do is get, get yourself down to this tree and feed this frog these magic stones and then get this magic key off this frog. Yeah, yeah, I'll get straight on to that. Don't worry about it, Faust, me old. Me old, you know what I mean? It's like, don't worry about it. It's like, yeah, if I was a kid, I'd be like, no fucking way. I'd be straight out the door. <laughs> Whoa, God, I'd be gone. <laughs> I'll be straight under the bed covers. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I mean. And on top of all of that, she is meant to be a princess in this fantasy world. Yeah. That bit, that bit like uh, Kate Middleton, eh, William? <laughs> <laughs> another another princess in a in a fantasy world currently. <laughs> oh, so so you if you had been walking down that that corridor with the table yeah. on it, you would yeah. have been looking out for the curries and the spices. Yeah, well, like I say, I am I am a fat bastard, and I do like me foreign food, even though I shouldn't do because it's like sort of promoting the old uh, just think of the food narrative, but. Like I say, if I was um, <laughs> just a, yeah. you see, I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm getting I'm getting hints and warnings <laughs> and uh, and clues. But from... honestly, honest to God, right? I, uh -huh. I, I I'd have gone into a table like that. Let's just say I'd I'd managed to gather up the the the, the bravado to go down there. Yeah. Uh huh. And I go in and say, all right, you need to uh, use this key. Right, I'll use this key. What about Mush over there? And the old little fairy's saying, oh, don't worry about him. He's fine. He's fine. Okay. All right, doing it. I've got this. Oh, I've got this massive dagger. Yeah, it's great stuff. I've got this massive dagger. I'll put it in my bag and I'll bugger off. And it would. It didn't matter what was on that table. I'd have been Linford Christie straight out of that door. <laughs> I'd, have done the, I'd have done the Easter egg hunt. Got the golden knife and I'd be out of that door quicker than Usain Bolt. You would have been <laughs> hanging around for a little bit of shrimp dip or, you know, crispy fried or deep fried. I had uh, salt and pepper chili squid last night, John. Ooh. I went out for a meal with my me daughter and my lad and I had yeah. salt and pepper. For a starter, salt and pepper chili squid. Oh, it was unbelievable. Wow. And then I had um, Fill, sizzling fillet steak in black pepper sauce. That was lovely. It'll be all these all these people on our circles now saying, Oh, you're doing you're doing all you are doing the bad work for it was lovely. I don't care. It was lovely. <laughs> yeah, it was lovely. And the lady was lovely, Ling little Ling Ling, she was lovely. And uh yeah, it was uh <laughs> it was great. But even it even 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 as I was running past, I caught a whiff of this absolutely gorgeous, you know, salt and pepper chili squid, which is the best thing ever. I still would have been out. I, I, I tell you what, right? If if I'd have crapped myself, the, I'd, I'd have run past me crap. I'd have been I'd, I'd have been that fast. It would have been stationary, and I'd have been long gone. I wouldn't even have to wipe me bum. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Great. Uh. Okay, okay. <laughs> How do you feel about this girl's performance? Do you think there should have been a separation between her, her performance in the fantasy world as opposed to the real world, or what we assume was the real world? Or do you think it should have been played the same in both worlds? And did she do any of that, in your opinion? Uh, that thought never occurred to me. Um, the thing is that the way that... So at the end of the movie, she's talking to blank space when she's speaking to Fawn. And this is very similar to how in The Shining, where... Um, Jack goes to the bar, gets tanked. Wendy comes in. Jack, Jack, there's a crazy woman in one of the rooms. And then Jack is just there on his own, just staring at blank space, yeah. doing nothing. That's what it reminded me of. So the movie suggests that this is all happening in her head. 
if the entire movie is all ha if all of the weird creature stuff is happening in her head then I would expect uh, she would behave basically the same real world and in fantasy I would think in terms of what the what the what the character would do in real life she would behave basically the same that said because it's a fantasy world that she is inhabiting I suppose you actually might be right that she would probably have a very different vision of herself and I would expect that uh, her fantasy version of herself in her fantasy world would be somewhat different and seen from that perspective I suppose you might be right there may be uh, it it might have seemed more reasonable for her to uh, behave differently in her I think own head. I think she has to yeah I like that that makes sense I, get I think that. she has to behave differently because it's it is a fantasy if if we are all in agreement and I'm not saying that we are but if we are agreeing that, that what we see as a fantasy is a coping mechanism, then surely part of that coping mechanism is for the girl to be smarter or more stupid with the world that she presents herself with, because it's her then it's presenting all this stuff to herself. Anybody want to take up on that? I, I don't know. I'm still locked in my own thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Steve, we're discussing uh, Pan's Labyrinth. That's the movie we're talking about. Send some pictures. Oh, oh you've answered them. Sorry about that. Didn't see that one. Uh, Send some. Well, do you think, uh, William, do you think I've got a point here? Do you think she would behave differently? Um, I think it would have been harder. It would have been harder for her to to achieve that. But I think what? that overall, I think overall she, I can't fault her, to be honest. For such a young uh, lassie to play, it's quite a tough role when you think about it. I mean, I think even a an adult might struggle to to play that role. So I thought she'd done really well. Um, I should have clicked that she wasn't quite right in the head uh, near the beginning when she that big weird bloody sort of uh, grasshoppery dragonfly <laughs> creature appeared, and she's like, "Oh, I seen a fairy." I was thinking, "What the heck? That's not a fairy." <laughs> <laughs> I kept thinking, shoot it, man, just crush it, just kill it. <laughs> <laughs> so I should have clicked then that uh, something wasn't quite right. But yeah, I thought she'd done really well. But how, about... I mean, you see, this is what troubles me about what you're all saying. How do you know that that creature wasn't real? You're assuming that, that it's not it, real. Because it was clearly it's a, a CGI creation. <laughs> Sorry? I'm joking. Was... I'm kidding. It was computer generated. The joke is it was computer generated. <laughs> right, well. Okay. Okay. Do you see my point? I mean, there's a, you, you've all jumped onto this assumption that that creature, similarly because it was up close and in focus to the camera, that somehow it's not real. Well, why not? Yeah, well, real or fake, I just wanted to crush it, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> and when she opened up the book, she opened up the book uh, to show the this weird creature, what a fairy actually looked like. I was kind of thinking, right, now crush it. Crush it with the book. <laughs> <What in it? laughs> it gave me the creeps, man, to be honest. I'm going to be having nightmares, and honestly, cheers, sense them. <laughs> Yeah, it was a very disturbing film in several instances. Well, I, I, as I say, I'm not so sure that I would automatically make the assumption that that creature is part of a fantasy. If, indeed, she's having a fantasy, she may, in fact, be experiencing 
an alternative reality. Or am I the only one that's going to consider it? <laughs> that did uh, cross my mind at the end. Sorry, Eki. At the no, end, sorry, I did I'm, think... I'm, I'm interrupting, sorry. No, you're all right. I did think at the end, is it an alternate wor world that she's in? Or crossed over between somehow? That's. I think that's why I kind of wanted to watch it again. Well, I'll be interested to hear what you you think if you do watch it again. If you draw any other different conclusions. I'm just not so quick to jump at okay, we know it's a special effect, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's being presented to us as a fantasy. I mean, King Kong is presented to us as an effect, but it's presented uh, to us as if it were real. Well, that doesn't make it real. So I'm saying the same thing with the insect. It just happens to be on the other side of the scale. It's supposedly quite small. It is creepy, I do concede. But does that mean necessarily that it isn't real? There's lots of creepy things we know are real. It, it, it kind of reminded me like a cross between a dragonfly and a, and a uh, Chernobyl grasshopper of some sort <laughs> but then when it shape shifted into a fairy I kind of thought ah okay it, it's fantasy <laughs> yeah and the weird thing for me was that as that original form it came across as something that would belong to a steampunk type setting and then it shape shifts yeah. into a, a, an actual creature you know, this dark, you know, a typical dark fantasy style, twisted looking, is it good, <laughs> is it evil type fairy? You know, do you trust it? Do you not trust it? Well, I don't know. It, it can't talk to me in English and somehow it understands Spanish. But hey, we'll, we'll roll with that. Um, but yeah, the, the initial thing, it was like, oh, is this going to be some sort of steampunk thing, which I thought would be really, really, really cool. But alas, no. You see, I think if you're going to present the audience with two separate worlds, as the director does, it should be, in my view, if I had been the director, I would have had anyone in that fantasy world behaving in a different way from the way they behave in what we regard as reality. And I didn't see her do that. So if she's projecting it all in her mind, it still stands, in my opinion, that she would behave differently. And if she's not, and it somehow is an alternative reality, which does exist all around us, then she, she should still be reacting quite differently. And I didn't see that. Okay, I'm going to be um, a little bit of a wet blanket, just a touch, only a hair. Um, I think this is a failure on the part of the writer, and that's my main issue with uh, the movie is that the writing is uh, suboptimal relative to what I like. So, uh, for example, I think you're right. It makes perfect sense that she would behave differently in the fantasy world. I view that as a failure of writing. And similar to um, my problems with the captain, the captain is a little bit too cartoonish for my tastes. So I view that as a failing of writing. And the whole thing with the uh, the table she just plucks a couple of grapes off the table for some reason that makes no sense at all. Like it's not set up. If they had set it up earlier that she likes... Sorry about Los Angeles happening in the background, by the way. <laughs> uh, if they had set up 
the fact that she likes to, you know, steal things or if she feels like she always wants to get away with something or play yeah. tricks on people or something like that, if they had set that up that that's a part of her personality before the table scene happens, then I would have been like, okay, fine, she's she's being weird and she's going for the grapes like an idiot but it makes sense in terms of her character but they never set that up so it's uh it's a behavior pattern that is not consistent with anything that she's done previously so it makes no sense at all i view that as a problem of writing that's a writing problem so that's See, that's what i think i think it's a, I, I would agree with you that's what i'm saying i agree here that there's I think because of the man's background and I can easily imagine that, you know, on a daily basis doing that work, being caught up in the visuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not enough attention was paid to how the character would respond to the fantasy or the reality, whichever way around you want to have it. It doesn't really matter. And again, then, being the writer and the director, then he's the one who carries a can for that. But I agree with you. Is There's a failure in there. Because if we separate out the fantasy world and create two different movies, what is the purpose of the fantasy world? What, what does it serve the viewer? It doesn't serve in to the characters because they don't know about it. Only the girl. So what purpose does it serve? As far as I can tell, the only purpose that it serves is to have cool looking special effects and a weird death sequence where a little kid dies and goes to see her dead father that's the only purpose that i can find exactly my point uh, which by the way uh just for the sake of it you'll note that there is curiously an element of another movie that was made like 20 years previous to that uh it, starring Tim Robbins uh, it's a movie called uh, Jacob's Ladder that was made in like the late 80s or something yeah, and the entire that, movie, I'll spoil it because you're not going to miss anything and it's not good <laughs> but whatever um, the movie is about a guy in Vietnam who dies and then hallucinates about like demons or something and that's it, that's the movie <laughs> the entire movie is just him having a dying hallucination mm. and pan's labyrinth in some sense is like a lead up to that death hallucination mm. that's it that's the movie a little yeah. girl dies and then she hallucinates about her father ta-da that's it's like wait what <laughs> i th i think i said this last night samuel did i know if we remove the fantasy from the film and run the film as is, minus the fantasy. Is there anything lost? No. Absolutely no. And that's other the point. Than, other than the cool special effects. Right. So if we leave that aside, because you sh should never, as we all know, we shouldn't be judging yeah. a film on, on special effects. So if we take that out of it, then we can say, we could run that film minus the special effects and still arrive at the same points so what's the point of the special effects what's the point of that fantasy world being there and i can't find one myself apart from being able to show us these wonderful special effects in and in a, in a fascinating world that is is possibly real or possibly not real but it, it doesn't add anything to the story and what is the story do we know 
what the story is, folks. Am I just going too deep here? <laughs> no, the story is, in my opinion, the story is flimsy, flawed. That's my actual opinion. The story is flawed. It's it's incoherent. That's my actual problem with the movie. Because on a basic level, the only thing that you have is a little girl um, disobeys her parents. She uh, kidnaps a baby and poisons a guy. And then she's shot <laughs> by <laughs> a guy. And then the guy loses his son to a bunch of communists and uh -huh. you're like wait what <laughs> what's going on why yeah well that that's just my point what is the story here that the communism is going to save the, the child from becoming this bad fascist is that the story is that the message but even if let's say that you take that but to you then you place. have to agree that communism is a great thing well, yeah, but let's let's just let's just assume that that is the case. All you have to do is look historically at what the communists did in Russia and Spain and in Germany, and or in anywhere China. they've ever been. Yeah. So it's like, okay, the little kid was saved by what, by who, and they <laughs> gloss over that. Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro glosses over what the communists were actually like, and it's like that little kid was not saved. Like, no. it's just tragic. It's tragic all the way around. Nothing about that movie is yeah. good. Everything ends in tragedy. A little kid dies. Another little kid is kidnapped by communists. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this is this is what I, I, I'm getting to, in, in my opinion, that he, he's trying to present... I think he's the director or... The, well, He's the director and the writer. So he's trying to present us with a film that has two levels. And we're supposed to interpret these two levels in some way or other. But the, in my view, the, the beginning trouble is the fact that the girl who's supposed to be at the center of it all behaves exactly the same way in both worlds. But then if we take the the, the fantasy out of it, are we get any less of a film or do we have the same film? I think we have the same film. And as you've all agreed, the, the, the fantasy thing is just a showcase for the man's brilliance and, and special effects and what have you. I forgot. Not only does she poison a guy, not only does she kidnap a baby for a blood sacrifice, she also performs a blood ritual for her little brother. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was done better than Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> there you go. You know, I, I expected a, you know, a song and dance number, you know, Feed Me Seymour from, <laughs> from that. <laughs> So let me just go ahead and say this. See uh, the movie was written by a communist and it involves demons and blood sacrifice. <laughs> right. And, and I thought you were going to make more of this, A.K. I thought you would have made more of it. But he doesn't have a genetics for, for where you like to go. <laughs> well, that's not to say that all communists are of a, a certain no, uh, no phenotype no i know i know i'm teasing well i think that's what's wrong i think well let, let me back off and, and say this and get your all of your opinion on what i'm about to say all right a lot if not all of the films that have been made that have a subtext message in them, I'm going to suggest to you all that most of the time 
that isn't done by design. And I think that this man was trying to do that by design and failed. Hmm. Come in, anyone. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, at the end, just you know, the the child is. If you look at it as a, you know from a political standpoint, the child is then um, gifted to the communists, uh -huh. and, right, and and taken away from our, our family. Uh huh. Whether or not we approve of the family's politics, yeah, yeah. because the whole family may not have his politics, yeah, and we don't know that, yeah, and even if we do, does it necessarily mean? That his politics are bad and going to be ill suited to the child. Do we know this? Yeah. Are we making a judgment call? Yeah, I think you are, in my opinion. I think you're making the same judgment call as the in the Hound of the Baskervilles, yeah. Uh -huh. The the there's the person who's out on Dartford Moor, on uh, Dartmoor waving his torch is yeah. the brother because he's the wicked felon. And he is the brother of uh, one of the housemaids in uh, Henry Baskerville's manor or whatever. Yeah. And so she was trying to provide him with food and substance and all that kind of crap. <clears throat> Even though she hadn't put a foot wrong. And I don't think Mercedes, who was the sister of the communist faction uh, bloke, not, I wouldn't say leader, but one of the members, I don't see her as being, you know, communist. I think she was just in the same way as in yeah. uh, Baskerville, the sister was helping the brother. I think oh. she was just trying to help her brother. Yeah, I think that's a blood connection now that's going on. Yes, I, I do. And when she took the baby... She knew that the father figure was a thoroughly odious character. And so she said, we'll get to those final words now, because I think it's a good point now. He will never know your name. But I think that Mercedes will have taken that little child, and this is what I believe, that Mercedes will have taken that little child under her wing, brought him up nice and proper, would have ignored all that commie bullshit. Because like I say, once the... Once they're out of that sort of scope of their own little enclave, if you like, I don't think. Uh, well, the question is: Would the kid have grown up better with his dad, no mother, and no sister, because they'd all been killed, obviously, um, in in that kind of environment versus, you know, the nurturing potentially nurturing environment of Mercedes? Yeah, uh -huh. well, that that is the question, and I I can't answer that. But what I will say is, I don't think that Mercedes was an out and out communist. I think she was just helping her brother, much in the same way uh, the the the, the Bas Henry Baskerville's housemaid wasn't a criminal. No, but she was trying to help a brother who was a criminal. If that makes yeah. sense, you're yeah, trying no. to you're trying to conflate that Mercedes was an out and out communist. No. I don't see that either sense. Of, I agree with you. I Purely think because her brother was a communist. Yeah. I see it more of a responsibility to her, what appeared to be younger brother. And yeah. I think anyone would do pretty much the same given similar circumstances under threat of your own incarceration because as much as the regime would like you to discount all kinds of blood ties and ties to nativism and your people, if you like, I think that still counts for something, in my opinion. Oh, and yeah. it's to be sure that, you know, I would do the same, given the same um, circumstance, and I'm pretty certain that most other people would as well. You know, you may not agree with them, but you're not going to cast them to the wind. Well, if you've got anything about you, then... And the people who do cast their family members to the wind are usually the ones who are responsible for them going into those circles in the first place and therefore they have a sense of remorse that they probably either turned their back or pushed them too far to end up in those circles 
Whereas, you know, what 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 can you say? I don't. I say it's it's. I don't think it's the same as. I don't. I think it's a conflation to say, and the child was given to given over to communists. I think the child was removed removed from somebody who was potentially going to be a bad father. Potentially, we don't know because obviously he's dead. Who had no mother, who now had no sister, but who would have been too young to look after him anyway, and mm-hmm. potentially was probably looked after one of the most nurturing spirits in the film, which was Mercedes. So, yeah, yeah. in some in some ways, Mercedes was more motherly than her actual mother. Um, well, yeah, because the man was poorly all the time, though, wasn't it? So, yeah, yeah, because the the mother character. Again, because of bad writing, we're like, why would she simply agree to marry this man? Well, um, once make, again, I just, it, I just you know, other other than that, I'm alone. Like, I I would me? Let, let me let me give you just just a, as a little rebuttal there, mate, Samuel. I just all the only reason why I would say is that it's slightly different is because when the Germans entered France. And we're harking back to the sort of incident that happened in the mid-century last year. A number of French ladies had young children to men who'd fallen as part of the initial incursion that had come into uh, into France. So when they'd gone over the Maginot line, those that had been lost at Dunkirk, because don't forget, it wasn't just British soldiers that were at Dun- Dunkirk, it was French there was yeah. several other nations that were there. Yeah. yeah. So those women were widowed in in a time when you know the Germans had free reign all the way up to um the French northern French coastline. And a lot of mothers, young mothers in particular, who had young children, they would, even if they were holding the nose, they would align themselves with a you know whore themselves away if that's what you want to say yeah if that's what you want to call it they would whore themselves away to high caliber german officers or commandants or sergeants or whatever because if they didn't do that then any sort of tom dick and harry um private or soldier who was badly inclined would have their way with them. Whereas if they aligned themselves with a strong leader, even if they knew they were a bad person, some many of them weren't bad people in fairness, they would align themselves and form relationships with those people that they knew was a protective measure and it would keep them and their children safe. So I don't see that as being so far of a stretch imagination of course i have reason to believe i i think that probably the this is just me surmising the young girl's father was probably um not a franco sympathizer he was probably killed for his beliefs and i think that that captain probably raped the woman and when she was pregnant found out and thought well i'll do the right thing so the kid's not born a bastard and uh, we'll bring her up to where I am now, and that, that's how it goes on. But it was the same when Berlin fell. A lot of the German women who had young kids aligned themselves a lot more closely with American soldiers, you know, because they didn't want to face the brunt of the attack that was coming from the Russians and also the sort of the bog standard squaddies that were in the American forces that thought. In some instances, not all, you know, in some instances thought, oh, well, it's it's a free holiday. We can just go and do what we want. Whereas if they've got the threat of a sergeant or a captain or a major or whatever, you know, you go anywhere near that young Frau line and I'll have you, you know, I'll have you bloody court-martialed. They were prepared to do that. I mean, a lot of those French ladies who did do that at the end of the Second World War were thrown out into the streets, had their heads shaved, and were pilloried for their what was it? What, what, what did they call them? Um, collaborators or collaborators, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, but a lot of them did it to protect their children. So I don't think it's too much of a stretch of imagination to see this this woman who had a young child 
and who was still very attractive in her own right until obviously she became pregnant and fell ill with her own kid, you know, I don't think that's too far of a stretch of imagination because women will do virtually anything to protect their children. And I think that's pretty much the vibe I got from this 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 part of the film. Well it sort of it sort of fits the dateline for the movie because the movie's set in 1944 and the civil war in Spain was in the 30s so it would kind of fit the uh, the background that you're setting up sensor the hobby was killed either fighting or not fighting just he's killed in some way or other we don't know about and as you say it leaves the woman with a baby it, it would be at that point and yeah what you're saying is highly possible highly possible can when we consider the situation that europe's in and spain's in at this point so by the time we get to 44 that daughter could easily be that age <clears throat> depending on when hobby was killed or died i mean he could have died in an accident for all we know yeah he could have got knocked down in by a car as he crossed the street <laughs> i just i can't help but find this amusing that you guys are taking the generous and sensible position meanwhile in the back of my head i'm still like no but they're commies bro <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm agreeing with that as well. They are commies. But we have to give a little latitude, do we not? Because we have the advantage of knowing things that I don't think those people in 1944 could possibly know. Communists as they are. Now, how could they possibly know what was going on in Russia and had been going on in Russia? For all those years. Yeah. Dude, what do you, all they would have to do is just look it up on the internet. You go to Breitbart. <laughs> <it's there. laughs> you know, sometimes we forget these things. The fact that uh, we don't know how isolated any of these people were. But I'm certainly not giving communism a pass for the, any of their actions. That's for sure. I'm just saying, how would how would anybody know? Perhaps somebody like the captain might know, because he's on the other side. And I know fine well from real actual history that. A lot was known about what was going on in Russia by the uh, Bolsheviks from the beginning. But I think I think I would agree with Aki in so far as overall the film wasn't written as well as it might have been. I think had it been written a little bit better we may have had a, a much much better film than we get i'm just going to come back to the same thing that i've said every time the the central character is a little girl that disobeys her parents poisons a guy and kidnaps a baby for a blood sacrifice like that's just where it ends man <laughs> 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 there you go, Toffee. Sorry about that. Left it up to them. Well, has anyone got anything to say about the directing? Do you think it was well directed? Both elements, reality and fantasy. I liked it. Yeah. I think he did a good job. Um, as we mentioned before, the weakest 
element is easily the script, which is again by him. Um, but the direction is 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 good. Um, I, to me, it felt like uh, from dusk till dawn almost. You've got two stories. They try to splice them together. Is like we could have a Spanish Civil War type story, or we could have this dark fantasy story. Both would have been interesting on their own as two separate films, but we got an amalgamation, and the amalgamation just didn't quite click. Uh -huh. Which was a shame. Perhaps it would have been better if the reality, there had been less of the reality and more of the fantasy. That might have made both worlds more supportive to each other. Yeah, because if we if we look at it as the central character is the young girl, then if we're viewing the world through her eyes, she'll, she'll have, be oblivious to the goings on of the real world and be focused purely on the fantasy. So the time spent in the fantasy would have increased and we would yeah. have had more stuff. But on the flip side, that could have been entirely to do with budgets and costs. And well, that's they, true. They, they, they couldn't afford any more time in the fantasy world. So they were like, well, let's do cool makeup and special effects for stab in the face and uh you know slice open your face and all that kind of stuff sure. I, I i don't know uh, no I, I think that's fair to say that what were you william what do you think um it's a tough one for me because i don't watch many fantasy films so it's hard for me to kind of compare it but i'd have to say it was pretty good in, in the way of direction and uh, as the film got on it it did kind of grow on me um, slightly then at the end I, I I kept thinking well what's the message here and I kind of thought is, is disobedience the message is it trying to say that disobedience is the right thing to do did anybody else think that or was it just me no, well, I certainly didn't think that, to be honest, William. Yeah, for, for me, I it was probably the point that, of the film. Now that you mention it, that does seem to be a, a theme within the movie. Now that you mention it, I'll have to think on that. Disobedience. Or the flip side, obedience. Yeah. How do you... How do yeah, you the, get the, there, is, there is definitely an element of that. Yeah, there's definitely an element of that. Well, I was just going to ask you, Willem, how how do you get to that view? How do you how did you get to that view? Basically, with the the final kind of scene. All right, the ending in particular. Yeah, where she was asked, "Look, hand it over. I've got to get the blood of a, of an innocent." But she said no. She was determined that it wasn't going to happen. There was going to be no blood spilt and then her dad comes up uh well vidal the captain comes through and she's speaking to but there's nobody there yeah and then of course he he shoots her and takes the baby but i kind of thought there well <clears throat> is it disobedience that they're trying to say look sometimes that's the right thing to do all right all right I see what you're get, getting at. Yeah. Because obviously in the real world, all the obedience is served through the, the military faction. Yeah. What do you say, Sensor? I, I thought the direction of both parts was great. Um, you know, it was in it was in keeping with the the flow of the film, albeit with a, a a less than optimal script. But the you know the scenes that we saw, they were, they were very well um, directed, particularly the scenes where you see, um, you know, just to, <laughs> just to bolster one of Williams' argument, you see the the captain leading from the front, you know, like literally riding up to face these guys and yeah. You know, shooting at them, 
you know, mano y mano sort of thing, rather than, yeah, I'll just stay here. You guys get yourself up there. He was straight up and straight. Oh yeah, he laid from the front. But they were. I thought they were, um, you know, very well, uh, very well directed. The fantasy bits were once again well directed because you were quite. I always found when you knew you were going into the. The other the other place it was quite um, edgy. I was like always on edge. I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, I mean, you got the, you got the frog to begin with, which was wasn't menacing. Okay? So I think that sort of got you into the feel of oh yeah yeah this is going to be a bit of a bit of a fantasy. And then this, the second mission, if you like, where she was in with old. And the eyeballs blow that was a lot more disturbing and then obviously the final scene where she just goes up to the, the realm with the mother and father and she's going to sit there with them but <clears throat> I, thought it, I, thought it, I thought it was all those bits were well directed within within that particular movie uh, you know the sort of the, the natural world if you like will just probably edged it for me because it's, those were very well uh, they're very well directed we're actually we're actually losing you sensum me yeah that's better oh oh no uh it does that <laughs> every now and again i've had uh, i have actually had a few internet outages all right um, okay it's in, the in fairy world weeks. coming to get you. That's a... <laughs> 77 Brigade knows where I live, so <laughs> they've they've got their magnets on the wires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I thought it was very well I thought it was very well directed and I thought visually I thought it was really good. So cinematography and special effects were you know, when you think about what is it now? almost knocking on 20 years old. I don't know exactly when it was made, but it must be knocking on to around about 20 years old. Not bad, you know. 2006. It was 2006, yeah. Yeah. So, and it was all, it, you know, they didn't uh, go to the likes well, of industrial light. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not all that green screening stuff either. No, but they didn't, for the digital effects they didn't go to a big one they did they was pretty much in house and yeah. I was, yeah. it was quite impressive for a non major um you know effects company yeah and i'll be honest the the, the film that i saw subsequently and this would be I'm going to say early 2020 because obviously it was before COVID. The next film I saw where I thought the special effects were outstanding um, and it wasn't by the likes of Pixar and Industrial Light Magic was um, a pretty, pretty boutique film done pretty much entirely by the Serbian Film Foundation, which was a film called Crawl, which was quite a curiosity oftentimes comes on to channel four um it's the equivalent of a crocodile version of jaws shall we say <laughs> but the special effects are outrageously good mm. and it's not a serbian film well it is a serbian film but all of the actors in it are american and it's in american dial well it's in english dialogue shall i say um a couple of people you've probably recognised from other things, but that was the next film that I've seen subsequently. Where, and I thought when I saw the special effects, I actually purposely stayed in the cinema. That was probably the last film I saw at the pictures. Oh no, telling the lie, the last film I saw at the pictures was um, Godzilla minus one a couple of months ago, which was mm -hmm. incredible. I enjoyed that, but before that, it was twenty twenty. And I, I stayed stayed back just to see the credits to see who'd actually done, and it was pretty much like all Serbian. It was Serbian effects team, Serbian film crew, 
it was and the effects are, effects are outstanding i mean very very realistic um the film the film's sort of mid you know it's a mid film it's probably about a six between yeah. a five and a six yeah but the effects were outstanding and this like I say for a film that had no input from sort of the the world leaders if you like at the you know us uk when it comes yeah. to digital digital film technology in, in japan shall we say very impressive very impressive um can i can I, very very impressive. <laughs> I want to go back to this business of uh disobeying and a being that has crept into the conversation and i should to remember and think about the scene in that corridor room where the banquet's laid out and she takes the key and she puts it into one of the three locks and then deliberately takes it out and puts it in another one. And yet, those little creatures that we're going to assume are fairies are telling her not to put the key in that lock that she puts it in and opens. Is that also part of this obedience, disobedience thing? There's another interpretation, though. Um, the other interpretation would be that uh, she is uh, being tested and she has the uh, possibility of uh, guessing incorrectly or guessing correctly and she's being uh, told incorrect and it's up to her to guess the correct uh, keyhole place. That's another possible interpretation, but I still view it as being poor writing because nothing was yeah. set up. So... Yeah, there's no reason for her direction. to say. Yeah, there's no reason for her to deliberately pick another key. You know, particularly when these creatures are meant to be our guides and they're pointing. It's like, no, 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 this this one here, this one here. And you'll uh, note, by the way, that the, the 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 keyhole that she does pick, that's the one with the knife. Yeah. So yeah. There is a, sort of a passive um, um, assertion point. Uh, there is the the concept that she is in some way choosing uh, the blood sacrifice of her own volition, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, probably unintentionally. But again, I view this as poor writing, to be honest. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw your attention back to that, as nobody had mentioned it. I do think, uh, coming back to Will's idea of uh, disobedience being uh, a theme that's seen throughout the movie. Yes, that is another example of disobedience on her part. Yeah, well, quite openly, I might add. Because as Samuel said, uh, those little creatures are saying, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's look at the entire movie from Will's standpoint of it's actually thematically about disobedience. She is disobedient to her parents, to the fairies, and uh, ultimately, she's rewarded by seeing her father. The reward for disobedience is you get back together with your family. Well, the price is death. Yeah, like, okay. <laughs> okay, I guess that's the theme of the movie. <laughs> you could point to the theme being good morals can reward you. Because that's what it kind of boiled down to at the end. She she would she wouldn't do certain things, and then to an extent got rewarded with seeing her dad and her mum, and okay, being the to princess. Be fair, like she kidnapped a baby for a blood sacrifice. Like she doesn't get <laughs> good boy points for saying no -uh at the last minute. Well, hey, we can't all be perfect, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'll it... have to think about that the next time I offer up a baby for blood sacrifice. <laughs> Well, perhaps it all comes down to some more uh, ordinary is that 
By the time we get to that scene, the, the director stroke writer himself isn't clear anymore from where he started when he wrote the thing. Because obviously a certain amount of time has passed and now they're shooting that scene and perhaps he himself has changed his view on what was supposed to happen to aid the baby and knife and the girl. See, I, th I can see how that story was open-ended right up to that point. Yeah, because you could, you, you could take it further and say, is it about free will and fate? You know, had she... Yeah. Had, had the film somehow shown what the content of that original middle uh, door with the key, where she pulls, you know, which she didn't choose, you know, is inside that also a knife? And it, the, the, the meaning would be, well, it doesn't matter what her choice was. She was... Well, we wouldn't know that, son. We yeah, well, I know, I know, I know that we, we have no way of knowing. But had the film been changed in such a way to show it at some point, um, but it's just like, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, we're, I think we're reading too much into it and making a better story than the one that was written, uh, <laughs> and, and just trying to explain the, the puzzling choice, shall we say? Because that whole scene that she, she enters that room goes against their guide, guidance, then does it again, what was it, three times? She she waves them away when she's... Yeah, I think, I think it is. Yeah, yeah they, 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 they really... More likely they, be three than two. Yeah, they, they really stressed, you know, that, you know, don't do this, don't do this, and she swap, you know, she's like swatting them away. Um, and then obviously it comes to life, but it's like, yeah... You know, at, at that point, I was on board with the fantasy realm and the characters, and and then it was like, yeah, whatever, yeah. Yeah, because it, it all gets confusing. She takes yeah. the grapes when she's been warned by the fairies and by the fawn not yeah. to eat anything, but she does. So you may well be right here, William, about this aspect of obedience, or perhaps, as Samuel was saying, um, destiny and fate. Is it what's left laid out for her? Is it is it laid out for her, or does she choose and change it? Yeah, I think it's. it's an a, sorry, I was going to just add to William before uh -huh. you go on. I think it's is a confusion of writing. I don't think he, I think he's changed his mind somewhere in the writing of it. I think he could be right. It was, but at the end, it was where I I fought it most. And then when I fought, kind of looking back on the film, it seemed like she always wanted to disobey the captain in particular, this sort of fascist regime that was controlling her life. Well, I, I wouldn't even put it that way. If we take what you're saying as being correct, and I think there's every possibility of that, it's a girl rebelling against a man that has been imposed on her as a father figure, and she has not accepted this man at all on any level. Yeah. And that's a common thing, as we all know in life. Woman marries a second time and, and has a, already has a family. And that family refuses or cannot accept a new adult coming into the framework. So that makes more sense if we just look at it on a mundane level, William. Yeah, yep, I hear you there. And you're probably right about the the script, the writing of it. I think John should have wrote it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> It'd have been a lot darker how that written. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot more dead communists. <laughs> you know, a bit, a bit that really got me is when the guy's away to get his leg cut off. No, oh. like, oh no, 
<laughs> Please, no, don't show it. Don't show it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Make sure it's a blunt so <laughs> Pretty awful. Yeah. Pretty awful. Well, we're coming now to the point where I'm going to ask each of you to grade this film. And I'm going to start with, I think, Eki. Eki, one out of ten, ten being the highest, where would you put this film, Pan's Labyrinth? Um, that's a tough question. I don't know why I didn't think about that until just this moment. Hmm. Uh, okay. Considering, okay, so obviously I've got my own gripes about, um, the writing always. Um, but the special effects were pretty good. Uh, and it did look good. I guess I would go like a five, five on it. That's my own personal assessment. I think that other people would probably like it more than I would, but I'm extremely cynical, so I suppose that must be taken into account. So yeah, I'm going to stick with 5.5. Five. Okay. Samuel, what would you give it out of 10? 10 uh, being the highest. Well, as I said, when we watched it last night, um, I wasn't high on it. I've slightly grown more into it slightly not much um <laughs> my, my original assessment was a two but I, th I thought that was too harsh for the technical aspect of it so i will bump it up to a three and a half three and a half okay send some out of ten how would you rate this movie as you're the one who recommended it for review. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think in 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 the inverse of Sam's appraisal, originally when I saw this, I'd probably give it a seven. Yeah? Okay. But I think the second time around, it's probably a six and a half. And I don't mean to dissuade other people from watching it because I think if you watch it for the first time or indeed for the second time you still get a bit of something from it and it is it is a curiosity of a film that's the thing yeah. it's a little bit a bit like that one um the Eki that Russian film the Eki yeah yeah uh -huh. <clears throat> once again yeah. you know that's a little bit of a curiosity of a film so yeah it's good that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's good that we have films for review which we all know about, and it's good that we have films in review which we've not ever even heard of before, such as that one that Eki brought to the table. And what yeah. was that one again, Eki? I'm sorry for being ignorant. Uh, Stalker it's... in 1979. That's it. Yeah, Stalker, that was it. Yeah, that because when that first started, when I was 10 minutes in, I thought, this is shite. <laughs> at the end of it, and at the end of it, I thought, yeah, that's really clever. <laughs> so it is what it is, but yeah, I'll stay. I'll tell you what. I'll be fair. I'll give it the the feeling I had when I when I first watched it. I'm going to give it a seven. That's just me personally. I'll stick seven. to what I thought originally. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. In my opinion, how I enjoyed it and. The surprise of it being novel at the time, I'd, I'd happily give it a seven. Yeah. Okay. Right, William. How about yourself? Um, it's a tough one to to kind of rate. Um, I don't want to be too harsh because it did intrigue me. As much as it, it took a while for me to get into it. Similar to Samuel, I was a bit like, hmm. What a sense I'm done here. Where is he? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it's not often you say I'm intrigued to go back and look. True, that is true. Um, I think I'm going to go right down the middle and give it a five. Very good. A five. 
So top of the charts is seven from Sensor. Excellent. So whose choice is it next? Uh, you're not going to get away with that one, John. What's your rating? Come on. <laughs> don't, don't, don't pull that one. <laughs> you're not going to get away with that one, sunshine. <laughs> I'm not going to give it as high as I would like to give it. And I'd like to give it higher because in my heart of hearts, I think it was a very ambitious film that he tried to make. And I think it fell short. In fact, I know it fell short. <sighs> because I think that's what he tried to do. I think he tried to present us with two different worlds. Yes. Uh, and somehow the girl was traveling back and forth between the two worlds and trying to make sense of the life that she had or found herself in. Yeah. Special effects just blew me away the first time I saw it. Uh, and even last night when I watched that again for the second time, I thought it was wow. You know, very, very impressive. Special effects. Some of the ideas I had never seen before. You know, using a bit of chalk. You paint a doorway and it becomes a doorway, that sort of stuff. Yeah, great, I am. Um, do you, do you great remember ideas. film? From the late '80s, I think it was John called Paper House. Do you remember that film? No, that I don't. Sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got a few films that, that I didn't buy, but have bought, been bought for me that have similar great ideas in them. I, or watch. I was watching one the other night. There, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. I hadn't. It's called The Queen of Spades. It's, it's from a, a Russian short story. It's a British film. And it's just absolutely incredible. The ideas, the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but getting back to this, this is what I think about it. And I want to give it more than I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it. And I think I'm, I'm going to reluctantly give it six and a half. I'd like to give it a lot more. Well, yeah. Now, I levelled, to be honest, second time round, I was thinking six and a half, but I stuck to a seven because first time around. And like I say, at the time, there were there were a few bits and bobs that made it quite unique that have probably been, I wouldn't say plagiarised, but certainly hackneyed in, in subsequent mm. films yeah. going along that era. Yeah. And as regards to who's next in the camera, well, I've I've shared my screen, John. If you want to flick that up, but we've um, right. it's actually yourself, John. Oh, is that? Ooh. Yeah, you're next in the camera, and the topics you or the segments you've got free are biopic, documentary, horror, and sports. So there you go. Oh my God. So there you go. Oh. Uh, uh, well, you don't have to decide now, obviously, because I didn't decide when. No, I when, know. Um, I know. When, when, when I first said it was about a week or so later when I made my mind mm -hmm. up. But um, if you refer back to this stream, or I'll send you this image I've just clipped there, it is yourself, John. And um, I wasn't sure whether it was or not, to be honest. And we're running running low on topics. I, I'd happily pick any one of those. I bet Samuel would as well. It's usually the the strugglers like William and Eki who, uh, you know, they're <laughs> just not not as well versed in the uh, <laughs> movie land. <laughs> no, I, I, t I tell you now, I've watched some crackers recently. There was a one that could cover both the sports and the documentary one. So. I saw one recently. I won't, won't say what it is because that would spoil it. But I, I just I saw it, and it was, it was, sports, but it was a sports documentary, and it was brilliant. It was funny, it was prescient, and it was, it was good. It was a good film. It was a good film because 
a lot of the people in the film that you that, that you knew, or at least I knew anyway, because you know. But um, yeah, yeah. So there you go, mate. You've got you know dip dip your bread on that one. <laughs> <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> well, anyway. Well, it won't be sports, I don't think. Actually, I was uh, a while back then. I watched a, a really interesting, decent sports movie with about tennis. Believe it or not, it's a modern thing. It had oh, sound in it, tennis. William, and it had color. <laughs> <laughs> tennis, tennis, and golf. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'd love to do? I'd I'd love to have a decent budget. This is my <laughs> this is my film ambition at the moment to have a decent budget and make a film, a drama about snooker because it's perfect for drama. Yeah. yeah. The game of snooker. I like a bit of snooker, yeah. I like you the guy Higgins. It. Alex yes. Higgins. Yeah, yeah that, would have been, that would have been nice. But Years yeah, ago when I, was I, a, when I was a whippersnapper, um, ended up going to Doug Mountjoy's club in Manchester. He had a club in Manchester, yeah, a snooker club, but it was a club, club, club. If you know what I mean, yeah. And we all we all rocked up there one day, and I was introduced to Fred Davis, who was quite yeah. elderly, but who could still play. I, I must have been ten at most. Wow! When I met Fred Davis. And he was he was a lovely gentleman, and oh, um, yeah. old, real old school that man. Well, Joe Davis was. They claim that Joe Davis, even to this day, the likes of Ronnie O'Sullivan and them say that Joe Davis was probably the greatest um, snooker player of all time. Yeah, you well, know? you got to remember that that that, that the. Uh, Everything about the game has been changed. The balls are different now. Yeah, the tables are different. There's ivory balls back then as well, so they weren't as accurate. So correct and heavier. Oh mm. Jesus! Well, what ivory balls. <laughs> when was this? Nineteen twenty. <laughs> no, this is this is not not as far back as you may imagine, William. Do you know these whippersnappers? You know. <laughs> These youngsters. Yeah, I don't know. If it has no appreciation. Go on, sorry, John. If it, if it hasn't happened a fortnight ago, and you'll see the <laughs> mystery. TikTok <laughs> generation. <laughs> That's William. Hello. It happened three weeks ago. Huh? We'll need, I'll need to go to the library and get a history book on it. <laughs> I tell, I tell, I tell, this is, I tell you something now, right? It's the God's honest truth. My lad said to me, do you fancy going to the old snooker club? Because every now and again, I get uh, shanghai into giving him and his mates a lift or either a lift there or a lift back. Oh, it's yeah. usually like a one-way trip. So you either get shanghai into the going there bit or... Shanghai into the coming back bit, and I realized why because my lad said to me a few weeks back because I had a day off, and uh, he said, Oh, I'll take you to the old uh, snooker club there. I goes, oh, I haven't played snooker in Yonks. Oh, we'll play pool. I goes, Yeah, you know, you go to a snooker club to play bloody pool, you know, it's yeah. just like tra a tragedy, a tragedy, sir. Yeah, absolutely. We got oh, there, absolutely. I tell you now, right. And I said, oh, I see why you and your mates come here. They must have had like a thousand different bloody um, craft beer type things on the taps. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, well, if we stay in for a while, I might have a half of each of those because they look great. <laughs> <laughs> but we ended up there and uh, he says, oh, what do you want to play? I said, oh, I said, snooker's too hard and too long and my eyes don't work as well as they used to. I need a set of Dennis Taylor's, which went over his head when I said that. Of I need course. a set of Dennis Taylor glasses, do you know what I mean? Yeah, that was long. You ended up playing American pool, which is the 10-foot table, but the pockets are the size of buckets. Yeah, but when, we, when we rock up, there's, uh, you know, a fucking film crew and everything, cameramen and shit going on. I'm like, what? what's going on here? And it was... Uh, 
Oh, it, was a, it was a. Um, well, no, they weren't waiting on me because obviously <laughs> they, they they obviously hadn't appreciated my genius beforehand. But uh, yeah. yeah, so we rock up and there's these like cameras and all this crap going on. And this particular place in Durham, it's actually in Durham City. They've got a competition pool table, like a properly, you know, mm -hmm. only the proies can play on this pool table. They've got shed loads of what is it, um, seven seven before and half tables, which are the you know the red and yellow uh, straight pool, as we would call it, tables. Mm. And so we rock up and. Uh, Something, hey, there's something going on here. This must be a proper match here going on. He goes, yeah. He said, I've never seen this before. Because it was, it was on a weekend, so it was probably busy. So um, I went up to the bar. My lad was driving, so he had a bloody Red Bull or a LucasAid or some shite like that. And I said, oh, yes, well, I shall start by having... <laughs> <laughs> a Sierra Nevada IPA, which is wonderful stuff, which I've had in London before, which is lovely. So I had a pint of that. And I said to the gaffer behind the bar, I said, hey, what's what's on, what's occurring here? And he said, oh, it's a money match. Is it? Yeah. Is it like on tele? Well, it's on, on YouTube. This bloke's got a YouTube channel who films all of these matches, these money matches that go on. <clears throat> and apparently they have these backers who put money down. It's a bit like Snatch. You <laughs> put putting money behind these different players. And the players themselves get a cut of the winnings, if you like. Uh -huh. I said, all right, we're really? Whoa, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. How much is it for? And I'm thinking like a couple hundred quid or 50 quid. So 40 grand. Wow. Jesus. They were playing for 40 grand. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry for Shanghai in the stream, but I thought that was an interesting one because I couldn't <laughs> believe it. And I said, and I said to the lad, I said, I'll tell you what, we'll just watch for a bit. <laughs> so we we ended up watching, I think, and it was it was a, one of these ones where it was the the first one to 25 frames. Well, obviously, you're not going to stay there for 25 frames because that's like maximum plays is 49 frames or something. But we watched 10. And the youth who eventually won it was down 8-2. So it, it, this lad had come over from Ireland to play him. Uh -huh. And the Irish lad was 8-2 up after 10 frames. Wow. And when we, when we went in, like I say, we was off for a day. And we went in the other time we played the Amer proper American pool, just me and my lad. And I said, how that, uh, oh, our lad won. Did he? Yeah. Crikey O'Reilly. And there was a couple of lads playing on the proper competition table. And I says, are these lads playing there? And he goes, no, he's practicing, but he's playing this weekend. He goes, yeah, but I'm shit. I'm only playing for two and a half grand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'd be in ribbons. I couldn't even think about, you know, because that's the pressure, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's the good. real pressure. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, but it, was, it was really good. And of course, you know, don't like to, you know, I, I, I did, I did beat the shit out of my lad on the pool table. I didn't want to, of course, but unfortunately, you know, hand-eye coordination is strong in this side of the family. <laughs> <laughs> but most of them were hitting hope anyway. I mean, the pockets on them, you can't miss the pockets on a proper American-sized pool table. They're about three times the size of a snooker table. Well, here, here's a serious question to a parent, man. Should you allow your, your, your son or your daughter to win? Never. Should you play it straight? No. Yeah, yeah. Play it straight. Play it straight every time. Because I've been playing table tennis with a lad recently because he said, oh, I'll have a game of table tennis. And he's been beating me like a bloody drum. And I was pretty handy when I was a kid playing table tennis. However, you know, like I say, you know, uh, form is temporary and class is permanent. And once I get my eye in, I'll be thrashing the shit out of him on that as well. But they... <laughs> but they... <laughs> my dad... My, my, my dad was a member at the snooker club. And I used to go... 
And I mean, snooker was, it felt too boring. So I would play pool with my brother. And then after my dad was done, he would play us at pool. And he never, ever once let us win. He was always determined to to absolutely uh-huh. thrash us. So he, he, played did, so. straight. he played yeah. it straight. He played it straight, Dad. I don't yeah. think, in fairness, I don't think you're doing your children any favours by making them think they've won. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, I tell you. And 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 like I say, what what they <clears throat> like I say when they're younger, and if it's any particular sport, whatever that may be. And then they'll get to sort of they'll get to the sort of age where they're at parity, and like myself, when my skills start to fade out, they start beating me like a drum. But I don't want them to give me any quarter. Do you know what I mean? Because it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's well, it, I was I was I was, I was, I was <coughs> it's just interesting because my my uh, my body is quite my well my legs in particular are quite broken at the moment. They don't function how I would like them to. And a lot of that's to do with the fact that I'm a fat bastard, and a lot of it's to do with the fact that the NHS doesn't care, literally doesn't care, couldn't give a shit. But anyway, <laughs> that's a different problem. And um, well, when I was, I was going younger, to... okay. Go on, sorry, John. I was just going to say, well, when he was alive, my uncle Huey was a great snooker player, and he only had one eye, believe it or not. Um, and when you played Monko Huey, anybody played him, he insisted on giving you 40 points of a start. And I've never, I'd never seen him getting beat. No. He was that good. Yeah, well, there, there is a handicapping system in snooker, the same way there is in golf and in uh, squash as well. So if you play, if if there's if you're in part of a squash ladder, and you play somebody who's not on your level, uh-huh. they're obliged to give you an X number of strokes head start sort of thing. No, right. Pretty pretty par for the course in fairness, sure. but um, yeah, yeah, like the same. Like you know, I, I don't think you do your kids any favour by. Um, you know, I, I I don't agree with all this bullshit of participation awards and you know uh, everybody gets a medal and a trophy because <laughs> I came up from a you know my my sort of schooling years of the seventies and eighties was you know if you come second you were the first loser <laughs> <laughs> that's as much as you got <laughs> I know I've not heard that one. <laughs> first loser yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I understand. I, th- you know, and and literally, and, and I know there's already there's already a film with the same name, but for a completely different reason. Um, you know, a great title for a film of that nature would be called The Crucible because of the Crucible. Itself. Yeah, of course. Yeah, obviously, course. It was the Crucible about the witch hunts and that? Yeah. Uh huh. I can't remember when that was. Was that the seventies or something? I can't yeah, I thought Miller was it. Um, but yeah, but that would be. I I think because especially if you were to do, um, you know the, the sort of how how uh, snooker players get recognised, and a lot of that is through local snooker clubs get names, play money matches. Yeah, and the way through the ranks. That's how it works. Yeah, it's just one of those things that you know. It's one of these yeah. uh, daydreams of mine. You know, if yeah. I was ever given an opportunity, I'd be very tempted to do a, a movie about snooker. I think it's got all the the hallmarks of a great drama. And but I, I don't know whether I would be good enough to write a good drama around the game, but it's got all the ingredients for a great drama. And in fairness, the cost to producers, etc., is minimal. Yeah. Snooker table in a, in an auditorium, effectively. Yeah. So you've got no locations or sets or anything, maybe other than, you know, perfunctory backstories, but... Um, 
Yeah. Cool. I mean, and, uh, you can't go wrong with the drama. Sorry, John. Uh, you can't go wrong with the drama of of the films like, um, you know, The Hustler, and then latterly, what what exactly. was that one that he did in the eighties where it was uh, fast and Tom Cruise? Yeah, Color of Money. Color of Money. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've got both of them in my collection. <laughs> yeah, but like I say, you know, they are, they are both. Um, you know, award-winning, noteworthy films. Yep. Because didn't and Newman, money-making didn't... films as well. Yeah. Newman but made not... Newman won an Oscar for playing Eddie Felsen in the eighties film, didn't he? So, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, and uh, and if you think about it, uh, I have seen quite a few recently. Really, really good films based around chess. Yes, yeah. Well, there was a one on one of the popular channels called The Queen's Gambit with that uh, young lady and who's quite yeah. pretty. I saw that. that on, I saw that on Netflix. Queen's but Gambit. The one, the one called Porn Sacrifice with about Bobby Fisher, played by um, yeah, uh huh, him who played the original. Uh, or, or sacrifice, yeah, it's called Porn Sacrifice P A W N. Oh, sacrifice. Porn, not porn, right? Okay, I thought, yeah, yeah, going somewhere get, else. Get your, get your <laughs> main boy up, out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, Toby Maguire plays Bobby oh. Fisher, and uh, Lee ah. Schreiber plays um, Gustav. Uh, uh, that's a good cast. Yeah. Um, I think I've seen it. Yeah, so it's Bobby Fisher against um Hispano. No. Yeah. No, it's not Kasparov. It's uh You take care, Steve. Great, Steve. Let me just see who that is. I'm saying it's um, what was he called? The, the guy who I know it's Spassky, that's it, Boris Spassky, that's it, yeah. But it's great, and the Fisher was essentially well, essentially was was autistic. You know, right. he was pretty much an an undiagnosed autistic lad, and. Uh, Spassky was a thoroughly decent bloke and I can't remember if it was game seven in the series that they played uh, Spassky said it was the finest game of chess he'd ever witnessed, not even, he didn't even say played in, witnessed yeah. because, of, because it was a completely new version of attack, I mean Fisher was uh, you know, a, a complete and utter savant when it came to the game of chess because this was long before computers and because oh, yeah. a lot of the people who play now practice against computers that have memorized all the moves from virtually every single game that's been recorded since the end of time like that lad now uh, magnus carlson who's go doing the rounds in chess oh. he's 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 like the latest version of a savant but he's had the benefit of all of the modern technology so he's yeah. been playing against all of the masters since the end of time because his computer or his programming has has, has got all of the way that they played the game. But when sure. Bobby Fischer did it, it was like, you know, not seen anything like this before. Yeah, and he did it in being. Iceland, wasn't it? Can you remember? It was in it was in, oh, uh, it was in Iceland. It was in Iceland. Reykjavik, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Because of the turmoil between Oh, well, the United the States and Russia, yeah. Politics. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, I always thought it was a perfect uh, stadium for a for a movie, a snooker yeah. table. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. But anyway, that will not likely happen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, folks, it's time for goodbyes, I'm sorry to say. And uh, let me bring on the goodbye music. And we'll uh, close.
close off the live stream, folks. And uh, we'll start with Eki. Would you like to say goodbye and let people know where they can find you if you are doing any live streaming yourself or whatever? Um, I'm still not doing much in the way of live streams right now, just for various reasons. Sure. On a side note to that, there's going to be the eclipse that's going to come up here in North America. I'm going to yeah. go and see that, and that's going to be pretty cool. So. Yeah. Well, take care. Don't don't leave yourself exposed. Yeah. Well, at any rate, at any rate. Um, yeah. I'll take you the last days. It's unfortunate, but there it is. Okay. Um, I will say this. Uh, remember to floss. Obviously, always remember to floss. Also, um, when you pick movies, obviously, always defer to Sensum because he clearly has outstanding taste. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks for thanks for the invite. Uh, thanks for the recommendation. Send some. I haven't seen the movie in like years. Okay. William, I know you're walking dogs and what have you these days. So would you like to give out some info about what you're doing, where people can find you, where to follow you? Um... Well, still, it, that's life, but not as we know it. Uh, not planning on going live this weekend. If, I'm away at the football tomorrow, so maybe Monday. Ah. Uh, probably next Wednesday, actually. <laughs> but I'm on holiday from college, so I've got my Easter holidays. But when you've got three kids, holidays... They you don't, don't have, have holidays. <laughs> you never get any peace. So. No, no. But, Hey, I've really enjoyed it. It's been great to be back on. Uh, so thank you for having me. And you're looking well, John. Uh, it's Thanks. good to see you again. Thank you. And uh, I'll look out for your streams as well. Great stuff. I've got a question great. for you before you go okay. very quickly. How are you getting on at college? Um, Not too bad. It's quite tough going, to right. be honest. Uh, okay. I didn't, I never realised how the extent of assessments that, is involved so yeah 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 but i'm hoping over the two weeks that i've got off i'll be able to catch up there's a design that i've got it's a, a, a sort of new garden design that i'm drawing up right. um so i've got that to catch up on and i've got my it's like a journal to catch up on <laughs> so <laughs> i'm hoping to get them out the way then that's a big part of it uh, kind of out the way so Good but mind. apart from that, all the assessments I've done so far, I've passed on. So it's, it's, looking, it's, look, it's looking okay. And, uh, I'm sure I'll get there. I'm sure you will. You keep up the good work. Cheers, John. Take care. Yeah, you too. Speak soon. Well, who does that leave? I think that just leaves Magic Man and our Sensum. Magic Man, have you got anything to say before you, I take you out of the stream? Uh, thanks for everyone's coming, uh, everyone's comments and chat. Always good to see. Um, be interested to see what you pick. We've got a suspicion you may go one particular of those three genres. Um, but yeah, it was good fun. Um, definitely, and you can reach me on my socials at Magic Man nineteen seventy seven on Twitch. Twitter and YouTube, where you'll find absolutely no new content. So <laughs> Okie doke. Out you come. Sensum, what have you got to tell us about where you'll be? And I know you're busy over the weekend, so where are you to be found these days? I'm on, I'm on the on Telegram and uh, YouTube, John, but this, I'm glad he's gone because he'll be chuckling away to himself, but this weekend, uh, Saturday night at 8 o'clock, I'm joining Body, Bonnie Lad and Scottish Tam for the Three Amigos Easter special stream at 8 o'clock on uh, Bonnie Lad's channel. And then immediately after that at 10.30, uh, 
I'm over on 42's channel for the three men walked into the bar. Oh, all right, excellent. With our, with our good friend DJ, so me, 42, and DJ. And then on Monday, even though I haven't put it up yet, uh, myself, DJ, and Toffee will hopefully be streaming at seven, the slightly earlier time of 7 o'clock on Easter Monday. So that'll be a triumvirate of truth stream. Uh, at seven o'clock on Easter Monday, so that, that's uh, that's me. The, the you know, as, as William always says, you know, I'm, I'm never around. I, I, I don't want <laughs> social media or any stuff like that. Even through the week, I've been I've been completely absent most <laughs> of the week on, on on YouTube or Telegram or whatever. But William would have you believe that I am the backbone of YouTube, and and there <laughs> here I am to say that I'm not. And yet, there I am streaming three times this weekend. So there you, there you go. There you go. Oh, good luck, my friend. Thank you, John. Take care. Yeah, you too, my friend. So there we have it, friends, neighbours, and audience. Another movie review night has gone past us. Hope you've enjoyed it. And I know I have, as always. Uh, this was a tricky film to review for many reasons, but we got there in the end. So, as I always like to say, enjoy the rest of your weekend. If you get a bit of weather, then get outside and enjoy it. And you know where all the shows are. I will be here. A uh, bit of grace from God. I shall be here on Tuesday. And uh, next Friday. So, as I like to say, adios, au revoir, cheerio, and until Tuesday evening, Take care. Thank you for being here. And enjoy the music. And I'll speak to you all soon. Bye just now. Silently the snow falls Paints a winter to see Swiftly spreads the dark rim Hides a fading autumn green Moonbeams brush the dark wood Conjure friendships dear to me Lightly now the breeze flows Disturbing more than just the leaves But life's much more and we can know We are one small glow In the eternal flow Patiently the love grows Lifts the weary heart Gently now she holds me Melts two worlds once apart Moonbeams brush the dark wood Usher dreams of you and me Softly then the breeze blows Disturbing more than just the trees All together then But love's much more So much more than we can know Than we can ever possibly know We are one small glow What an important glow In the eternal flow Melodies of long ago Songs of innocence Harmonies to suit the soul as the consequence 
Moonbeams brush the dark wood. Awakening joys of you and me. Silently the snow falls. Bringing winter symphony. All together now. But we're much more. So much more. Than we can know. Than we can ever possibly know. We are one small glow. But very important glow in the eternal flow but lies much more than we can know we are one small glow in the eternal flow So take care, folks. Thanks again for being here. And we'll speak again soon. Bye just now.